This is how you go from an idea into a fully working, production-ready, AI-powered solution for your company. If you're a VP, a CEO, or a CTO at a company, I'm sure you had brilliant ideas on how to incorporate AI or custom software solutions into your company to take it to the next level. However, we've seen that most of the times, these ideas go into the infamous AI money pit, where ideas get overbuilt, overpriced, or just go and they're never adopted. Over the next few minutes, I'll show you the exact eight-step playbook that we use to make sure that ideas go into production-ready, valuable projects. Whether it's for internal use or external customers, this repeatable process makes sure that you keep stakeholders aligned, scope sane, and ROI visible at all times. Before we dive in, my name is Francisco. I'm the head of project strategy here at A Studio. A Studio is a custom software development, machine learning, gen AI, and design studio that works with entrepreneurs, and executives to take their ideas from zero to one. We're experts in AI, not just in product, but also we do lots of AI research. And on top of that, we work with operators that don't want to hire whole tech teams to make their ideas a reality. We make sure that in every project, we drive value and move the needle for your business. The first step in our eight step process is to align and define business outcomes. You know, in a business, there's only really two things you can do, either increase revenue or decrease costs. When you're thinking about a custom software or AI solution, it has to be framed within those two things. That's it. Why? Well, because when you go to your decision maker, when you go to your CFO, you and I have to tell them, hey, you know, this is gonna cost X amount of time or money. And there has to be a tangible result that they need to see. Which leads me to my next sub point here, which is don't frame things in terms of features, frame things in terms of outcomes. When you're defining your project, don't say, hey, I wanna build a chatbot or I wanna build a predictive analytics platform. That doesn't work. What you have to do is say, hey, I wanna increase customer retention for a service by 40%. If you're able to do this, then customer and internal buying is gonna be easy. The decision on how to build it will come next. The next step, the second step, is to map out your current processes and data. Why? Well, because by understanding your current processes and data, you can understand how can I fix them? What's stopping me from achieving that business goal? By going through the process of what your employees or yourself have to do every single day and identifying what thing hurts the most? What's the bane of my existence? We can identify it. You can identify it. What are the most important places that I can attack to build that business outcome? If you're building an external tool and you want to, let's say, increase customer retention, understanding where these customers are leaving, what are their pain points? Why are they going to competitors? Is going to be crucial to deliver that business value. Also, by understanding how your processes look like, you can improve your process without actually having to build something else. And bonus tip, if you realize that you have no processes for certain things, this would be a great opportunity to create some. Because when you go to your technical partner, you're gonna have to explain to them, hey, this is what we need to be fixed. This is what we have. This is the data. This is the process. And if you yourself don't understand that, there's no way that your technical partner or your internal team would understand what they need to do. And now we go into step three, which in my opinion is one of the most fun ones, which is to build a clickable POC of whatever project you wanna do. You don't need to be technical to do this. AI allows you to do this now better than anybody else could. So what does this mean? You take your business outcome, you take the processes that you found out from step two, and you feed them into your AI of choice. Could be ChatGPT, could be Anthropic, could be Gemini, it doesn't matter. What you do is you ask it to act a strategic partner for you and give you feedback on the ideas and how to solve the problem that you have. After that, you can feed those same outcomes into themselves or into other projects like Lovable, Base44, Firebase, Anthropic itself, and tell it to build a clickable prototype of your idea. What this is gonna do is gonna create a front-end experience, a clickable demo of the process that you wanna improve on and how this solution would look like. This is gonna be crucial when you're sharing this with internal stakeholders to ask them about feedback for the project, would they use it or not? Are they seeing the value for it? If they don't see the value, they'll tell it to you and then you can pivot. But if you don't do this first and you don't get internal buy-in, this is not gonna work. So use this clickable prototype for at your advantage. And then, you know, when you're actually going to a tech team, you can actually show them exactly what you want. People are very visual. Don't just send them a giant document of what you wanna build, show them. Use AI to your advantage. Number four is arguably one of the most important steps here as it involves choosing the right development partner that's gonna help you build this thing. Before you even think of hiring anybody, you need to understand your own capabilities. It is important to do a gap analysis within your business to understand, hey, do I have a bandwidth problem? Do I have a technical ability problem? Or do I have a strategy problem? Meaning that I don't know how to translate 
goals and to technical features. For most companies, it's all three. Thankfully, we do all three here at AD Studio, so you're covered. After you identify your gaps, you need to identify an internal champion within your own team that's gonna own this whole project. They're gonna be the person that interfaces between your own company and the technical team that you're gonna end up choosing. Which takes us to the next step, choosing the right technical team. The most important thing that you need to consider when choosing this team is that they're outcome focused instead of featured focused. What does that mean? If you talk to them and they just ask you about a set of features that they need to build, that's a red flag. If they're talking to you about, hey, why are we building this? What is the business outcome? Why do we need to do this this way? They'll understand that this is not just about building and putting buttons and colors, it's about driving value to their company. And then, you know, because they understand this, all of those micro decisions that people that are coding every day do, those will be informed by the outcomes that you tell them and they'll have way more ownership over what they're doing. Another very important point is to figure out how they work and what's their process around scope. What happens if the scope changes? What happens if we discover something throughout the process? Do we need to stop and rescope everything? Or can we just keep going and really try to get the most value possible? That's gonna be very, very important. And of course, pricing, timeline, availability, time zones, etc. But if you wanna have a successful project, you need to understand and have somebody that understands the business outcomes and the value that they're driving. You have just seen how defining outcomes, mapping out processes and choosing the right team will make or break your AI initiative. If you want more no fluff, board ready insights, hit subscribe. This channel is for decision makers who value results over buzzwords. Okay, we're back to step number five, which is to build an outcome driven roadmap. Once you've actually chosen your tech partner, you need to figure out, okay, what are the next steps that we need to do to build this product? That's where the roadmap comes in. An outcome driven roadmap is one where you define the outcomes which by the way, we have done already, and give them to the tech team for them to understand what is our goal. The opposite of this is to build a feature-driven roadmap where you build for features and out outcomes. And when you build for features, that's where you're gonna get a bunch of features. When you build for outcomes, that's where you're gonna get outcomes. Which ones would you rather have? Also, another important thing that you need to consider at all times is have a timeline. You know, projects like this can take months, but you need to have regular milestones and check-ins to understand where are we in terms of the outcomes, in terms of what we wanna do. You might start with a POC, then you go into an MVP, then you keep going. Same thing with budget. You know, you have to have an understanding of where you at in the development cycle in terms of budgets, in terms of value, and really figure out, hey, are we having ROI on this? If we are not, we need to change our process, we need to change our outcomes, we need to change our team. Value is the most important part for your company, for your CFO, and for your customers. So make sure that you're giving it to them. Step number six is the simplest one conceptually, but the hardest one to implement, which is to build in constant iteration cycles. What does this mean? If your team, yourself, or an external team is working off assumptions instead of feedback, they have it wrong. These projects take a life of their own and you need to understand what the user wants, what your technical team wants, and what your internal team wants. If there's no communication, that's not gonna work. You need to set up structures in which there's constant communication between the tech team and the product owner. And it has to go both ways. The tech team has to be able to communicate to the owner what they've built, how long they've taken to build and why they're building it. Same way the other way around. The product owner has to be able to communicate priorities, changes in scope, changes that they need to do. If your development partner doesn't have these structures, you need to set them up. Thankfully, here at AE, we have them our own and I'll go through them in another video. Now you're in step seven, which means you did steps one to six successfully. This is where you can finally start sharing your product be it for internal use or for your customers. The most important thing here is to understand that you're releasing something that's not ready yet. It's a pilot, but you wanna be able to get as much feedback from your users as possible. Be it internal or external, have them try to break this as much as possible, give you as much feedback as you need. The reason why you're releasing it now and not before is because you wanna be able to give them somewhat usable product that works. If you release it too early, you know what the problems are gonna be. If you release it as an MVP that actually drives value, you're gonna have adoption and you're gonna have real feedback from real users to try to understand what do I need to build to make this amazing. If it's an internal tool, you wanna to find some people in your team that are willing and able to give you that feedback and try to break this as much as possible. If you are releasing this to a customer, you wanna get beta testers, a small group of people that will try to break your app and use your app as much as possible to give you that feedback. Sometimes you can give them something in return. If the feedback is amazingly positive, you're almost done and we can go to step eight. If that feedback still requires some iteration, you know, 
we can keep working on this. You've made it to step number eight, congrats. By the time you get to this, you should have done steps one to seven successfully. It's the final release and continuous improvement of your product. The final release should be a breeze. You already have the feedback. You already know that this drives value. You're going all the way. The important part that people miss is the continuous improvement part. Continuous improvement is something that's gonna be critical for their survival. Your company takes a life of its own. Your workflows do. Your employees do. Things will change over time. Your project has to be able to adapt to that. In order to make sure that your product stays alive and keeps driving value for a long time, you need to make sure you do two things. First one is have documentation. Have your technical team write down the technical decisions and how the project works, such that then in the future, another technical team or your internal team can always come in and fix this. The second thing is to have a dedicated maintenance team, right? There will always be customer feedback. There will always be internal feedback. Could be very small. But things might break. Make sure you account for that, or otherwise abduction is going to go way down. At the end of this video, I want to give you three closing thoughts on how to best implement solutions into your company. Number one, invest in clarity, not complexity. If you can't understand what you're saying or what you're doing, and you can't communicate this to your customers, your board, your investors, and so, nothing's going to change. Be clear in your goals. Number two, treat software as a product, not a project. Just like you have an ongoing marketing spend, you will need an ongoing software spend for this. Number three, culture drives adoption. Celebrate wins loudly, quickly, and often. Behavior changes follow recognition. So make sure you do that. And that's the eight step playbook. Make sure you follow it to take your ideas from zero to one and drive value for your business. The next video is specifically chosen for you by the YouTube algorithm and is now on screen. Click it and I'll see you in the next one.